So I think last week was great. Last week was really, really good. Uh, my favorite part about the entire day was those colossal brownies <laughs> that we got with our meal. They were, they were at least as big as the rest of the meal. And I'm okay with that. That's the kind of proportions I like to see in my food. Heavy on dessert, light on vegetables, yes, 100%. It was a great week. It was a great, great morning. We're starting a new uh, series today on uh, the one another's in, in Ephesians. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're going to start in chapter four uh, today. But it makes sense. We've talked about uh, where we're going as a church. Now we're going to talk about kind of who we are as a church. What, what, what are we supposed to be like? What's the character of, of a great church, of a good church, of a, of a church that's committed to Christ? Uh, and, and today we're, we're going to be looking at uh, unity with one another. And unity is a, a, a tough thing to find, uh, uh, particularly I, I find in, in political climates, in, in nations, it's hard to find unity. I've always kind of romanticized uh, the microstates of Europe. Are you familiar with these? There, there's like seven tiny states in Europe uh, that are independent countries, but they're like super tiny. So you've probably heard of some of, some of them. Uh, the Vatican is a microstate. Um, uh, Monaco, that ironically has all the casinos. Uh, is a microstate there on the southern coast of France. Malta, that you read about last week, I think, in, in Acts, in our dwell reading, that's a microstate. Luxembourg, um, Andorra, which is on the coast, or on the, in between uh, Spain and France. And then my personal favorite is Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein, which is a duchy, I believe, uh, it is between Switzerland and uh, uh, Austria. And apparently, it's so small, you can run into like the head of state, which you would think is a duke. Uh, you can run into the Duke of Liechtenstein shopping at like the grocery store, just kind of there. I'm like, that's kind of cool. Imagine like running into Joe Biden at Trader Joe's, which maybe that was why they called it that. And, and you just kind of have this moment where you're like, hey, Joe, how's it going? Good. It's good to see you. It'd be kind of an interesting thing. And I think I romanticize this because I think, man, it must be so easy to get along in that country. Because it's so small. Like, we have hundreds of millions of people in our country. We're huge. We have different cultures, so many different cultures within the American. It's just difficult. And then I think, I look at our church. I look at our church, and I think, well, we're smaller than a microstate. And sometimes we don't all get along. And so I, I, I think we underestimate how difficult unity can be. And on top of that, there are places and things in your life where you may not feel unified to the people that you're with. Maybe you feel uh, like an outsider in your family right now. Maybe you felt close, but this is just a season where you feel different. Maybe you're going through some mental health struggles, and so you feel like people don't know what's going on in your life and in your heart and your mind. You can't really articulate it. Maybe you feel like an outsider here at church. Maybe you're visiting from another church. Maybe some things happen there, and you're trying out a new place, and this is your place for today. Or you moved from another city. I talked to a couple last hour that had just moved from D.C., and they were trying out some churches. All sorts of things can make us feel like we're not unified to the body of Christ or unified with the people that we should be unified. So today, looking at Ephesians 4, I want us to see, one, that, that we are unified because of what Christ has done, but I want to see how we can maintain and encourage unity in the body of believers and there's really three ways that we are unified, looking at Ephesians 4, uh, verse 1. And the first thing is that we are unified in our deeds. We're unified in deeds and what we do. Look at verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Ephesians is, I love Ephesians because it's so uh, wonderfully organized. Uh, the first three, there, there's six chapters. The first three chapters are all indicative. This is who you are. This is who we are as a church. And then the last three chapters are all imperative. Now, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is what we do. And so we're coming out of the indicative part. And the, part, the verse that we memorized, Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, in our last series is the last thing uttered in the indicative portion. And now we're moving to the imperative portion. And notice Paul says, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord. I'm in chains. And notice he doesn't say a prisoner of Rome or a prisoner of the Sanhedrin. He says a prisoner of the Lord. And the reason why he says this, he's basically saying, I'm in the state that I'm in because of Jesus. My affiliation to him, my connection to him, my unity with him, I am in prison because of him. 
and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm bound to him in chains. And so he tells us to live. You notice what he says in verse one, I urge you to walk in a manner. It's, it's interesting that a man who is bound probably in chains and certainly can't walk very far because of his imprisonment is telling us how to walk. Some irony there. He's telling us how to walk. And he says to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. A lot of us look at callings that we have, and we think to ourselves, we're like, oh, what makes a calling significant is whether or not it's, it's important. The magnitude, the impact, the noticeability that my calling has. So if I'm called to do something big and great, it's an important calling, but if it's something small or behind the scenes, that's not as important, and that's not what Paul's saying here. What makes a calling worthy of your effort is the one who calls you. No matter how great, no matter how small, the one who calls you is what gives the calling its importance. And so when Christ calls us to do something, no matter how great or how small, it is critical that we do this. Why? Because of the one who has called us. And Paul tells us the way we live our life, the way we go about living out that calling is how we maintain the unity in the body of, of, of Christ. And he tells us four things to do. And the first one is humility. Look at verse two. To walk with, um, worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility. Humility means not to be overly impressed with your own self-importance or your own self-worth. Now this means, again, it's important you key in on the word overly impressed. This does not mean that you walk around and you're droopy dog and you're like, I'm not important. It's Okay. It doesn't mean you don't ever express your needs or your wants. It simply means you're not overly impressed. This, the world, the universe, does not revolve around you. Overly impressed with our own importance. So how would I know? How would I know if I'm humble or not? A diagnostic question I use in my own life, um, because... Like many people, I struggle with humility, right? Is when something happens, news, uh, uh, change in plans, when something happens, what is the first thing you think about? If your question is, how does this affect me? Or you respond out of, how does this affect me? You're not humble. Because it doesn't matter what's going on in other people's life. The first person I have to consider, the first person I have to think about is me and how it affects me. You see, humility is a spiritual discipline. You have to train yourself in it because our natural tendency, because uh, maybe it's hardwired in us like through a survival mechanism, but our tendency is always to think of ourself and those who are related to us, those who are part of our tribe, right? I've got I've to make sure they're taken care of. But it becomes a discipline so that you remember the world doesn't revolve around me. The universe revolves around its creator. And that things work best when everything is organized around him. And so again, that doesn't mean you don't express your needs. It means they take a back burner for a moment to consider how does this affect the rest of the kingdom of God, the rest of the people involved. And you make that assessment, and then you can kind of set your feelings and your thoughts aside or appropriately place them in context, right? Right? So there's humility. There's also gentleness. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness. Gentleness is really only possible if you're hungry or you're, if you're humble. Gentleness is not possible if you're hungry at all. We know this. You cannot be gentle with people if you are not humble, right? Because what happens is gentleness winds up being a tool for you to get what you want. That's what happens. Because what happens is I become gentle with somebody because I think I can manipulate them into doing what I want. Maybe I don't want a big argument to take place. So even though I'm upset, I'm going to speak kindly because I don't want this to blow up. Or we're, we speak gently with our kids because we want to be seen as a good parent. And I don't want to blow up with you inside this Marshalls. But don't make me raise my voice. True gentleness is also not weakness. We've said this before. It's controlled strength. Jeff says this a lot. It's controlled strength. Jesus wasn't weak. He could create and destroy with a word. That's not weakness. 
He had controlled strength. Again, if you want to know if you're gentle or not, look at how you deal with people in conflict. When you're provoked, how do you respond? This is an opportunity to kind of check yourself, to, to, to see. Is, is Maybe one of the reasons why I don't feel included is because I lack humility or because I lack gentleness with people. It's a time to evaluate yourself. And then there's also forgiveness. It doesn't say it expressly, but I think that's what's meant uh, in verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. That word bearing with one another in love means uh, putting up with people when you're provoked. A lot of us think we're really patient with people, but it might just be that you're not easily provoked. The true test of whether or not you're patient with people is, if they push your buttons and you're still humble and gentle, that's what real test is, right? Provocation, this is where the idea of one another comes about. It says bearing with one another in love. The response to provocation is love. Usually our society will tell us the response to provocation is resilience or is determination or with a fighting spirit. But Christ tells us, no, 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 the response to provocation is love. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 8. In 1 Corinthians 8, there's uh, different groups being provoked by the dietary habits that they have. And Paul says, out of this provocation, love one another. 1 Timothy 2, young people are being provoked by lustful desires. And Paul says, when you feel that, put on love. Lust is an is a, is a action that takes advantage of people. Love is one that serves them. Jesus tells us, although he doesn't use the word provocation, he, the embodiment of provocation is present. Matthew 5, he says, love your enemies. Those, your enemies are people who provoke you. They egg, egg you on, right? And he says to love them, love them well. And like I said, this ultimately culminates in forgiveness. Nobody does this well. Nobody's humble all the time. Nobody is gentle all the time. We are certainly provoked. And so we must be forgiving. If we're to maintain the unity, if we're to serve one another, we have to be forgiving. We have to be forgiving. And the reason why we have to do this is because this is who our creator is. Our God is humble and gentle and forgiving. That's who he is. He shows that to us. That's who Jesus is. He displays it on the cross. And then notice what it says in verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. These ideas the way we, we eagerly maintain unity is through humility, through gentleness, and through forgiveness. These are all ways that we maintain unity. They're all points on the path of encouraging unity. Humility is there so that when, when somebody does something that's provocative, something that usually pushes your button, something that offends you, you say, well, wait, you know what? They probably weren't, probably didn't mean it like that. That probably wasn't a slight. If you're offended easily, again, you might not be humble. Do you think everything's happening about you? On the other hand, gentleness is refraining from provoking people. I believe my love language is aggravation. <laughs> if I love you, I will bug you. And I need to temper that. Because if I don't, I'm not being gentle. And then when there is harm done on either side, you offer forgiveness. Now, again, there are, there are obvious, uh, I don't want to say exceptions. I don't think there are exceptions to humility, gentleness, and forgiveness. But I think there are different ways in which is it, ex is it expressed. Forgiving somebody who bumps into you is different than uh, forgiving somebody who abuses you. But I think both are in play. I think forgiveness is still something that takes place. It just looks different. And I think you need to have somebody help you walk through those things in the more complicated situations. But this is how we maintain unity. This is how we walk in a manner worthy of our call. And again, notice what Paul is doing. Paul is writing these things from prison. He's saying that being humble, being gentle, being forgiving, and following the God who embodies those things has landed me square in prison. They have cost me everything. And what he's saying is it's worth it. It's worth it. And so we often think, well, if I'm forgiving, if I'm gentle, if I'm humble, people are just going to walk all over me. People are going to treat me like garbage. And Paul would say, it's worth it. People are going to speak rudely to me. I'm not going to get what I want. Paul would say, it's worth it. I'm not going to climb the ladder. Paul would say, it's worth it. It's worth it. Because if you want to maintain unity, 
and you're trusting in Christ, then we will live like he lived. Forgiveness, humility, and gentleness. But it's not just that we're unified in our deeds. Think about it. There are lots of groups, lots of religions that are humble, gentle, and forgiving. Buddhist monks are all of those things, and in many ways probably do it better than we do it. Are we unified with them? Of course not. Why? Because we're unified in something else as well. We're unified in doctrine. We're unified in doctrine. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All. This is a series of ones where Paul is kind of outlining the core ideas, the core doctrines of the faith that allow us uh, to have shared community with one another. And he starts by talking about the one body. This is the church. Paul calls the, the, the church the body of Christ in Ephesians 1. That's where the idea comes from, Ephesians 1.22. But the church is not just an institution. That's what a lot of us think. It's an institution. It's not. It's an organism. There's a, a Dutch theologian named Abraham Kuyper. And if you want to know about public theology, which is basically living your theology out in the real world, Abraham Kuyper is like the guy you need to read. Because not only was he a theologian, he was also the prime minister of the Netherlands in the early 1900s. So I think he knows a thing or two about it. And he says this about the church. He says, the church is an organism because she bears a unique life within herself and self-consciously upholds the independence of that life over and against the old life. What he's saying is the church is this new organism. It's this new institution. It's this new body. We have institutions before. Institutions will be created after, but the church is this unique, special, living place that we're invited to be a part of. And what's so powerful about this imagery is that it's true of both the local church and the global church. We're united to this organism. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become one with this organism. You become a part of it. And it should supplant as your top affiliation every other affiliation in your life. The most important connection you have is to the body of believers, both global and local. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean the, the most important thing about you is your nationality, your ethnicity, your race. It doesn't mean that the most important thing about you is your family. It's your church. The church is the highest affiliation. Now, again, this doesn't mean that you come to everything, every event. It doesn't mean you come to, it's all about programs. That's not what's meant here. And I think a lot of us has, have misinterpreted this to understand that that's what it means. It's not. It's good to come to things. It's good to be a part of the life of the church. But we need to recognize the deeper implications that are going on here. What, the, what, what it means is that we as believers have more in common with a believer in South Korea than we do with a non-believer in Denton. It means that you have more in common with a believer sitting in the row with you right now than someone who shares your last name who's not a believer. Those are closer affiliations, united by the blood of Christ, which is a greater blood than the genetics you share with another person. Now, do I think this means you sacrifice your family on the altar of the church? Absolutely not. So many of us have, have maybe grown up in homes or no friends that we're just, we're there whenever the doors are open and it's this legalistic, ritualistic kind of approach to church. That's not what I'm saying. But so often what we do is we view our family, our church life, excuse me, through the lens of the family. So we approach churches, well, is this convenient for our family to go to this? We're going to do it. Is it, uh, is it important for us to be there? for our family? Are we going to get something out of this? Then our family will be there. I would encourage you to reverse that lens, flip it on its head. What does the church need from your family? What can the church gain from your family? View your family through the lens of the church. What kind of a family would be helpful for promoting unity in the church that we go to? That doesn't mean you come to everything, but it does mean your family's praying for your church, praying for your pastors talking about the scriptures. It's just a different way of looking at it. What's the primary goal of your family? Is it to produce kids that are, that are super successful and independent? Absolutely not. Not a Christian family. It's to produce disciples of Jesus Christ and to teach them that these are the tenets of the faith. That's the one body. And you might say, well, Travis, that sounds pretty far-fetched. Of course it is. I'm not up here talking about things you can do in your own power. That's why it says one, one spirit. Look, it says there is one body and one spirit, 
One spirit. We have to have the spirit of God to do this. You can't, on your own power, subordinate these natural affiliations for spiritual ones. It has to be the spirit of God doing, in us, doing it in us. But so often what we do is we trust in a different spirit. We trust in the spirit of tradition. We say, as long as we do the things that we've always done, everything will be okay. Or novelty on the other end. If we would just do some new things, we would be much more appealing to people and we would have more people at our church. Or the spirit of convenience. Well, I just don't like that time. It's not convenient for me to do that. Or the spirit of practicality. Why don't we just do whatever is easiest? That's my favorite spirit, personally. I think if I were to be a part of a Christmas carol, I wouldn't have the ghost of Christmas, future, past, and present. One of them would be the ghost of practicality. This is the one spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. He is the one that is maintaining this unity, that's binding us together, making us unified and having a holistic focus on Jesus Christ. This is why the passage talks about the one hope of our calling. Look again at verse 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. The one hope of the believer. Do you know what the one hope is of the Christian, of the entire church? We have one hope. When somebody asks you, what are you hoping for as a Christian? This is what you tell them. I am hoping that when I die, Jesus Christ will return in a physical body and will resurrect my body physically, and I will live in a new heaven and a new earth with him. And if you don't think they'll look at you like you're crazy, they will. And that's super fun. Because most people think Christians believe we're going to float off and go to heaven and have a harp and wings. That is not what the Christian hope is. Don't sign me up for that. That sounds awful. I want the resurrected body. I want the new heaven and the new earth. I want to be with my Lord who is also in the flesh. That's the one hope. But so many of us show up, and so, so let me back up, sorry. When, when we show up to church on Sunday, our hope when we're together is that you get a taste of that resurrected life. When you show up on Sunday morning, you're not hoping uh, uh, to hang out with your friends. You're not hoping to uh, get away from your kids for two hours while you're in the service. You're not hoping to get a donut, although they're good. You are hoping to taste the resurrected life that Jesus has promised you. Now, does that mean it can come with the form of a donut? Sure it can. Does it mean that it can come from the Holy Spirit rest that happens sitting here? While you have a moment with kids not speaking to you, you're able to think about what Christ is doing in your life? Absolutely. Does it mean you should bring your kids in here? Absolutely. Because they need to have a taste of that resurrected life as well. They can get that in the class. They can get it here. But what we do is we take these short kind of cited uh, desires and pleasures. And we think that's the resurrected life that Christ has offered us, and it's not. He wants to offer you something greater. And he wants to give you a taste of it. Every time the body of Christ is together, we're sharing in this meal, essentially, this spiritual meal, taste of the resurrected life. Then he moves on. He talks about uh, some other ones. I'm going to give you the Travis Cook enhanced translation here so you kind of see the, the bonds that are, that are formed. It says, we have one Lord about whom we believe certain things. This is the one faith and to whom we've been united by trusting him as evidenced by our physical act of baptism. So let's break this down. The one Lord in the passage that's talked about in the next verse, verse five, is Jesus Christ. There's other places where Lord references the Father or the Godhead. This is specifically speaking about Jesus Christ. And because it's Jesus Christ, we believe certain things about him. This is the one faith. We believe certain things about Jesus Christ, and we don't believe certain things about Jesus Christ. And we live in a world where people like to throw around the name of Jesus and be like, oh yeah, I follow Jesus, I like Jesus, I like... Something can have the same name and be something completely different. So let's talk about the core tenets of the faith. This is what we believe, and this is what faithful churches believe. And if they don't hold to this, then they're not an orthodox following church. The first is that we believe the Son of God is preexistent. That means he existed eternally with God. He is God. He was not created. We believe the Son is not different form or a different manifestation of God. This is what Jehovah's Witnesses hold to, that, that Jesus just was a different form of God. We don't hold to that. 
We believe that he is a person. The Son of God is a person, co-equal in glory to the Father and the Spirit. We believe the Son was incarnated as a baby, born of a virgin named Mary. His name is Jesus. We believe that he is both sinless in nature and in action. Okay? We also believe that he was crucified, buried, and resurrected to restore and redeem God's creation that had fallen. And lastly, we believe, as we said before, that he is returning physically to usher in a new heaven and a new earth and resurrect those who trust in him. This is the one faith. Now, there are other things I would add to it if we were outside of the doctrine of Christology. We talk about Trinitarianism, we talk about Scripture, talk about what the role of the church is, all that stuff. But as far as Christology goes, this is essentially brass tacks. If you want this uh, in a more condensed form, you can email me, I'll send it out to you if you didn't get a chance to write it down. These are the brass tacks. If you're outside of this, we don't worship the same Jesus. You can call him Jesus. We don't worship the same guy. It's not the same person. Just because something shares a name doesn't make it the same thing. My youngest daughter, her name is Sophia. There's a kid in my oldest daughter's class who's also named Sophia. If I go to her school and I pick up the older Sophia and take her home with me, that's not taking my kid home. That's kidnapping. (laughs) Just because they have the same name, they are not the same person. If I tell you that I lost my apple and you bring me a Granny Smith, I'll look at you weird. One, I don't have a Granny Smith. And two, I might have been talking about a computer. If I tell you that I was tweeting, one, you'll be surprised because I don't have social media, and two, you will think I'm doing something on social media. You won't think I'm out talking to a blue jay. Just because it has the same name doesn't make it the same thing. We are united to Jesus, and we're united to him by trusting him, that he is who he said he is, that he will do what he said he will do, and that we can't do the things that need to be done. Those are the things that we believe in. This is the one baptism. Baptism is an expression of faith. Baptism is me telling the world that I believe Jesus is who he said he is and that I am who he said I am. That's what we believe. This is why the passage says one baptism. Everybody that walks in the water of baptism is saying that. We don't get baptized to to mark a monumental occasion in our life. We don't get baptized to tell somebody that I, I want to live a different life. We don't get baptized because our brother or sister got baptized. We don't get baptized to, to show that we're a grown-up. Those are all good things, and they should be marked and celebrated, but not with baptism. That's not baptism before. Baptism is to tell the world that you need a Lord and Savior and that you believe it's Jesus Christ. That's what it's there for. And we do all of this because of what's said in verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Basically, this means that God has started all of this, he's seeing all of it through, and he's going to finish all of this. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, are you all in? I know it's the same question we asked past six weeks. Hadn't forgotten it. Are you all in? Because I want you here. I want you to be a part of our church. But I also recognize that if you just listen to that, you thought, I don't believe some of those things. I don't agree with some of those things. You have two options. One, you can say, okay, I I clearly don't fit here. I probably need to go somewhere else. Valid option. The other option is saying, Travis, can you clarify some of that? I know I made some bullet statements there. Can you talk to me about that? I I thought I believed something. Maybe I believe something else. I want to talk to somebody about it. Do you don't understand You truly don't. How excited I get when I get an email that's like a theological question. It's like Christmas. Because I'm like, I actually went to school for that. I learned how to answer those questions. I don't know that I learned much else, but I did learn that. And so people, and I say that because I get a lot of emails that say, I'm sorry to bother you. That is not a bother. If you have questions about what you believe, that's not a bother. That's what I'm here for. That's what we as a staff are here for. We want to help you. And so ask those questions. Please ask those questions. And know if you're all in. Know if you're committed. Because you have been rescued. And we want you here. We want you a part of it. But I want you to know that you, I want you to know why you fit in or why you don't. And to walk you through that, okay? So we're unified in what we do, our deeds. We're unified in diversity, or or sorry, in doctrine. And we're also unified in diversity. Verse 7, but grace was given 
to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the last verse actually kind of starts a new segment, a new conversation about spiritual gifts. When you are united to Jesus through faith in him, he gives us gifts. He gives us spiritual gifts that we then use to leverage for the growth and the unity of the body of Christ. Everybody that's trusted in Christ has at least one gift. And a lot of us miss the beauty of this because a lot of us think, and I'm probably guilty of this as well, including emphasizing this a lot, is that we talk a lot about what we've been rescued from, like sin, death, evil, addiction, that kind of thing, but we don't often talk about what we've been rescued to do, what we've been rescued for, what we've been brought into. And so you have been rescued so that you can contribute to the flourishing to the health, to the wholeness, the happiness of this place, of this body of believers, and every body of believers you participate in. That's why you've been rescued, to bring a little bit of that resurrection life to the the place where you are. You have a place here. You have a place to serve. If you're united with us by what you do and what you believe, you have a place here at Park Cities. No matter what your background is, no matter what your income is, no matter the color of your skin, your ethnicity, your language, no matter your family status, this is your church, yours. You belong here. And every single person that has ever done anything in the 84 years of this church's history has essentially sat where you sat, either in this room or in the sanctuary or in the chapel. And at some point, God spoke to them and said, I want you to do this. I want you to take that gift. I want you to take that ability. I want you to take that thing that I've given you. I've always wondered why you've got it. Guess what? This is why. And they start teaching a connect group, or they start serving somewhere, or they start a ministry, or they start going overseas. They start doing something. They start greeting. They start doing something. But everybody has sat where you sat. And every one of them, God has picked out and said, now's the time. What are you going to say? But maybe for some of you, that day is not today because you've never heard the voice of God in the first place. You've not been united with him by faith. You've not trusted him. You've not given him your life. And you're sitting here listening to me and you're like, Travis, you want me to be humble and gentle and forgiving. You're talking about all this oneness stuff. What? What you don't understand is you've missed the first part of verse 7, the first two words where it says, but grace. So you hear all this and you think this just sounds like a bunch of extra stuff I have to do to fit in. And what I'm here to tell you is that Jesus has done all the work you need to do to fit in. You just have to trust him. You just have to trust him when he says that he has a place for you, that he's the one that was forgiving. He was the one that was humble. He was the one that was gentle, and he did it for you to rescue you out of those bonds of feeling like you don't fit in, feeling like you're, you're alone, feeling like you're stuck. He died so that you might have a place, his place. It's called the substitutionary atonement. He took your place on the cross so that you could take his place that was rightfully his in glory. So many of us think that if we work harder, get better, do better, that we'll fit in more. Every one of us has made that mistake. And I'm here to tell you that is not the way church works. Church works by trusting in Christ. That's how you have the unity of the Spirit. That's how you have the ones going on in your life. That's how when you start, the the Spirit starts working and you start responding with humility and gentleness and forgiveness to provocation. That's when you become a follower of Christ. And you can do that today. There's a man in our, our community uh, who was a pastor at Highland Park Presbyterian Church. And his name's Brian, and uh, he did these things. He served, and he believed, and he was a good friend of Jeff, our pastor, and was really doing some great things over at our sister church. And he went to bed Wednesday night, and he didn't wake up Thursday mornings, 44 years old. And he believed these things. And our tendency is to think, oh, well, that's maybe another church. But do you all understand that, that we're one body? Their hurt is our hurt. Their pain is our pain. Our community is less 
because of that loss. And the Spirit of God, I believe, is going to step in and is going to continue to do great things in the church. But we can still grieve that loss. We can still mourn. We can still join with Allie, his wife, and his three kids and miss their husband and father. And you never know. Again, 44. I turned 40 like a month ago. Actually, a month to the day. I could go to sleep tonight and not wake up. You never know. Let me ask you this. Do you know who you'll see when you wake up? If that were to happen, do you know who you'd see? Is it Christ? Do you know that? Would you know him if you saw him? Because we are one with our brothers and sisters at Highland Park Prez, we're going to spend some time praying for them. And our tendency sometimes in moments like this is to be like, well, I'm not really connected. I'm just going to sit here and be respectful and close my eyes. I would encourage you not to do that. I would encourage you to put yourself in the shoes of that congregation who feels like their shepherd is gone. We have a former resident, Bailey Ray, who's one of their students over there. So one of, our own, or one of their student pastor is over there. We can remember him and his work. And we can think about Allie and her three kids. And put yourself in that shoes. And let's pray for them, okay? Let's pray now. Father God, we are so grateful that we have such a good, good relationship with the churches in our neighborhood. That there's not competition. There's not one-upsmanship. There's only celebration and encouragement God, I love that. I thank you for Brian and the way that he fostered that relationship with Jeff. I thank you that you brought him here 10 years ago to serve and to work. That this was the corner of the field where you placed him. And God, it, it feels like one of the primary farmers is gone. And those of us left to do the work wonder what you're going to do and how you're going to replace him. And I'm sure that's quite poignant across these streets at our sister church. God, I pray for comfort for them. I pray for rest for them. I pray for Allie and the kids. And just that God, in the midst of the shock and the grief, you would do what only you can do, and that's provide comfort, because as much as we want to say the right things and do the right things and serve them and support them, Lord, it's a deep hurt. Help them. Lord God, help us to know what to do. Maybe it's just to pray. Maybe it's to serve. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you that we are unified in you by your spirit. It's in your name we pray.